Each of us all across this great land has a stake in maintaining and improving environmental quality, clean air and clean water, the wise use of our land, the protection of wildlife and natural beauty, parks for all to enjoy. These are part of the birthright of every American. To guarantee that birthright, we must act, and act decisively. The Endangered Species Act, signed by President Richard Nixon, turned 50 years old in December, marking half a century of federal management and protection of specific species that are experiencing unprecedented decline. Daily Interlake reporter Kate Heston is bringing you a four-part series on the ESA, taking a comprehensive look at the species most at risk in northwest Montana, how the legal process outlined in the law has helped some bounce back from near extinction, and what it means when the lines between federal and state protections for animals becomes blurred. Keith Hammer is no stranger to litigation. President of the nonprofit Swan View Coalition, Hammer has repeatedly taken on the Forest Service and other governmental entities over the past 40 years. He sued over timber projects and forest plans, logging roads and snowmobile trails, pesticide use and habitat impacts, and in almost all of these cases, he's leaned on the Endangered Species Act. I think the key thing to understand about the Endangered Species Act, and it's important, is two main factors. One is to protect the habitat for the species, in this case, um, we've been talking largely about grizzly bears and bull trout, both of which are threatened here in the United States and in Montana in particular. And that uh, Endangered Species Act is very important for protecting their habitat. And also, uh, the other aspect is um, you need enough members or numbers of the species so that they can thrive and survive and not just hang on by their toenails, so to speak. So it's both habitat and the number of the species. So the things that we face today that are troubling for grizzly bears in particular is we have these massive efforts by uh, the timber industry, the mining industry, and now the governments of Montana and even the federal government to, oh, well, we've got plenty of bears, so they think they got the numbers problem solved, which is not true, but that's what they say. And so let's delist. And those claims are coming at a time when even we humans are feeling the press of the human population in places like Montana, whether it's Gallatin County or Flathead County. Uh, we've now reversed Flathead County is the fastest growing county in Montana. You know, uh, last year, the city of Kalispell alone grew at 10% in population. And so if we look at the Northern Continental Divide, which includes 12 counties or parts of 12 counties up here in Northern Montana, if we look at that, they think there's, you know, a uh, thousand grizzly bears or so. And yet we've got over 400,000 people in those counties. And the grizzly bears, they think are, their population is hopefully growing at about 2% or a little more. And yet we've got a human population, um, as I just indicated, that's growing anywhere uh, up to 10% in some localized area. We've got about 350 times more people than bears. And that larger number of people is growing at a rate far higher than what the population of a thousand or 1200 grizzly bears is growing. So that that's a very poor trend and a very poor um, forecast for grizzly bears. You know, just in terms of the numbers, we got more and more people moving into and recreating in grizzly bear habitat. If we take a football field, you know, so that we can imagine this and think of it as a, as a graph, 100 yards long, that um, 1,200 or so bears, they're out to the one-inch line, literally the one-inch line from their own end zone. And the human population in these 12 counties is already out there to 12, to about 10 yards. Then you start factoring in the visitation to Glacier Park alone, which is well over 2 million people per year, that's out 70 yards already. And the visitation to the national forest, and I bring these up, of course, because this is where the habitat is that the bears are trying to get by on. And the national forest is uh, also like over 3 million 
visitors per year. So especially cumulatively, those are out way, way past the 100-yard mark, well into the other end zone and beyond. And the grizzly bears, again, are at the half-inch mark. When you graph this on a piece of paper, the the amount of grizzly bears just doesn't even show up on a bar graph, you know, on a page of paper. So that's the problem with the, these population games, is that we have these increasing threats that aren't being considered when people start scream, yelling and screaming that we got too many bears already. Um, it's just a very selfish look at the situation if you do put it in perspective. More recently... Hammer sued the Flathead National Forest in 2019 over its revised forest plan, challenging the way the agency was planning to manage roads. The revised plan, according to Hammer, abandoned road closure requirements that are credited with helping the recovery of grizzly bears and their habitat. The Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife credit those road closures and road removal programs with helping to recover the grizzly bear population, and now simultaneously they're trying to delist the grizzly bear and remove those road protections. Hammer said as he explained why his group resorted to litigation. We've got new forest plans in Montana and on the Flathead National Forest in particular. um, The prior plan had a very comprehensive road management program. Roads are just death on wildlife and especially grizzly bears. They allow poachers, more poachers to get into the habitat and just shoot bears outright for no good reason at all. Bears avoid roads for good reason. They they fear roads. It doesn't mean they never cross them, but it means that in general, they stay more clear of roads. And when they do that, they lose the habitat near the roads. And so we had really good standards that put a cap or a strict limit on the overall total road density because they found that even closed roads were displacing grizzly bears. You can't just put a gate on them and say that everything's good or put an earth berm and say everything's good. Um, The bears still avoid them and then also motorized vehicles violate them on a pretty, pretty regular basis. And so when the new forest plan for the Flathead Forest was rewritten and uh, published in uh, 2018, they threw away that whole that whole road closure program. And so we've been litigating that since about 2018, and we've now won three times in court on the same issues. And the judges likened it to throwing away your umbrella during a thunderstorm because you're not getting wet. And that's what the government's done here. They, on the one hand, claim that, hey, this road closure program was so good that it's helping to increase the grizzly bears. And we hope that that's true. But then they throw it out, you know, like throwing the umbrella away as if we don't need to continue with that. So we have a situation now where um, we don't have a cap on total road density. The Forest Service and, and the BLM and other management agencies can build all the roads they want. And they not only don't have a real cap on it, but they don't count all those roads in road density like they did with the the prior plan, which was why it actually did limit the amount of roads that could be on the landscape. In June of this year, a federal judge in Missoula issued an order recognizing that logging roads intensify negative pressures on grizzly bears in their habitats, agreeing with Hammer that the standard the Flathead Forest used was ineffective when approving new roads for timber projects. Forest service projects are often halted or delayed due to long lawsuits, putting a pause on forest management or timber projects. That's a point of frustration for many in the logging industry, according to Tim McIntyre, the Northwest Regional Representative for the Montana Logging Association. The greatest threat to old growth and maturity is wildfire, disease, and insects, McIntyre said. The way to combat that is through management. We're in this whole system where we have to work together to manage our forests healthily and also protect those species. Specifically, McIntyre pointed toward the Cottonwood decision, a 2015 court ruling that many foresters often deal with when trying to complete forest projects. The decision requires the Forest Service to reanalyze the environmental effects of already completed forest plans across the West. That's where we see the majority of the problem, McIntyre said. 
These projects are put out, consulted on, get the green light, and then a litigator finds some minor thing to hold the project up. The Forest Service has done a good job of working through and doing management while protecting species of concern, but it's a loophole that's been found that's continuing to hold us up. The most recent and largest scoping problem has come from the Naughty Pine Project near Libby, McIntyre said, where courts halted a project in the Kootenai National Forest because of its potential to harm grizzly bears. The project was slated to begin early May of this year. In a similar case to Hammers, environmental groups said that the Forest Service downplayed their use of heavy machinery and new roads and their effects on the habitat. The case is concerned with the number of roads it would take to access the timber and how to enforce closure of those roads. The recent court decision stating that the forest does not really have a solid plan on how to deal with road closures is probably the biggest ESA issue facing many of the forests in Montana, McIntyre said. Most of these projects being held up are in the wild and urban interface and are desperately needed, not only for timber jobs in the local economy, but also for wildfire prevention. About 13% of forest projects receive legal challenges in the northern region, according to Cassie Wondersee, press officer with the Forest Service's northern region. These are generally challenges to the project planning process itself, she said. Analysis of impacts to the ESA-listed species such as grizzly bears and and Canada lynx are other common areas of challenges. In June of this year, Republican Representative Matt Rosendale and Ryan Zinke and Democratic Senator John Tester partnered with Republican Senator Steve Daines on a bill to get rid of the Cottonwood decision and change when consultation is required regarding a resource management plan or land use plan. It's a bipartisan push, McIntyre said, with support from both state and federal agencies, but it has yet to gain traction. Politically, between states, environmental groups, and federal agencies, the Endangered Species Act is challenged more than ever before, according to Lizzie Pennock, a carnivore coexistence attorney with Wild Earth Guardians. For example, delisting the grizzly bear in Montana has been tumultuous, where state agencies say the population is recovered and environmental groups argue that protection should continue. Grizzly bears are currently listed as a threatened species under the ESA. When they are removed from the federal list, the bears will be under state control, where hunting and management regulations are enforced by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Clearly, without the Endangered Species Act, Montana's mascot, the animal of our university in Missoula, the animal that represents the wildness of Montana, we may not have them at all, Pennock said. The state agency disagrees. The recovery of grizzly bears in Montana is an amazing conservation success story for Montana, said Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Director Dustin Temple in a September press release announcing the state's finalized statewide grizzly bear management plan ahead of delisting. This success story also proves again that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is committed to managing for healthy wildlife populations across our diverse landscape, he continued. The grizzly has yet to be federally delisted. One solution to navigating the tension, according to Martin Nye, a professor of natural resource policy at the University of Montana, would be to get federal and state agencies to, quote, embrace their obligations as co-trustees of wildlife, end quote, to recover species and then keep that species recovered, putting science ahead of policy. That can be achieved through giving states and tribes more federal funding while ensuring state governments strengthen wildlife codes and regulations, Nye suggested. That way, the gulf sometimes separating federal ESA protections and state management will not be so deep and stark, Nye said. The Endangered Species Act's fundamental purpose is to protect the ecosystems that listed species depend on, Nye explained, and some of the earliest recovery cases were simple compared to the choices that must be made today. Rare are cases that are simply resolved, he said, thanks to population growth, habitat loss, invasive species, climate change, and other systemic threats. The notion that a species is either imperiled or recovered is challenging to sort through. Fifty years since its creation, the pressure and disputes surrounding the Endangered Species Act are intertwined with the Act's purpose. Animals often remain a surrogate for deeper political issues, such as determining what makes a sustainable level and what constitutes recovery in a certain geographical area. It's obviously a lot deeper, and some animals bring to the surface more consequential questions like how wildlife decisions get made and by whom, Nye said. People should recognize that we're able to have arguments about grizzly bears because we still have them. And we still have them because of the Endangered Species Act. So we can argue and and even litigate about the nuances and whatnot. But without the Endangered Species Act, we would not have them here. We humans are only one small part of these huge um, ecosystems. And each species plays a very important part in that. 
And uh, it's a wonderful thing here in Montana to still have bull trout and lynx and wolverine and grizzly bears. And they, they're they not left in many parts of the country. The grizzly bear used to roam largely from the Mississippi to the Pacific. It's on the flag for the state of California. And here's where they exist now is, you know, a few portions of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho largely. A lot of the problem that we have with the Endangered Species Act is largely driven by industries that want to have at the habitat and don't want the bears in the way or to have restrictions and regulations on, for example, how many roads can we have out there for logging and mining and that type of thing. And it's, it's very much like we all are inundated right now with different political parties and people running for office that are just throwing crap at each other, you know? And that's often what happens with the Endangered Species Act. Well, it's a lot easier to blame it on the bear or blame it on the wolf or blame it on, on some of the threatened and endangered species rather than owing up to our own part in it as humans and our own um, societies and cultures and our huge footprint that's on the habitats of these these species that are just trying to hang on. And so sometimes you just you just gotta clear your mind of all of the 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 nastiness that's being thrown at the ESA and just realize how absolutely crucial it is to have what we have today, tomorrow, and for our kids. To read Kate's stories in full, visit dailyinterlake.com.